George West Jefferson. Um, would like to uh, give you all the opportunity. If you see someone close by that you haven't met, that may be visiting, or somebody you just like to get to know a little better, right quick. Let's take this just a few minutes and welcome each other, and uh, we can start. <laughs> They're waiting on go. Are you sure? I might, I might have to get a green flag or something. Starter flag. each other and our visitors. Uh, are there any announcements? I think Rick said he had one. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, from the Congregation Information Committee. I'm the spokesperson. There's some other people that have done a lot of work. Uh, the ladies have put it together. The gentlemen, I guess they've asked us, Fran and Jackie, uh, put this information sheet together with the input of Michael and Patricia and some others. And we are going to update our congregational information. And uh, you said, well, mine hasn't changed. <laughs> Oh, yes, it has, according to these questions that we're asking now. Because we're seeking a lot more information about what you're involved in, what you're interested in, that type of thing. So every household needs to get one of these information sheets. Instructions are included. I highly recommend that you read it before you start filling it out. Because we've already had some say, oh, I messed up. Well, read it all the way through, then go back and fill it out. And it may be turned in into the offering plate to the church staff or on Wednesday evenings. One per household. Not every individual has to fill one out. Now this is for, uh, for members, associate members, and regular attenders. So if you fit in those categories, please fill one out. That will help us put this data information together so that it may be pulled easily when needed. Any questions? Did I do okay? Yeah. All right. Thank you. The senior deacon team, along with the youth, would like to invite all of the seniors or close to seniors or want to be seniors to our fourth annual Meat Lovers Thanksgiving. It will be downstairs in the fellowship hall next Sunday after church. So if you will just call the church office and tell them you'd like to come, that would be wonderful. But if you forget to do that, come on anyway. So thank you. I will still have a few more red cards for Cash County Children's Christmas Project. I will be up front in front of the organ at the church. 
if you have not received one and you would like to participate. Thank you. Are we going to do Christmas cards this year? Christmas cards. Are we going to do them this year? Do you want to do them? <laughs> They'll be out then. Okay. You're welcome. I just want to thank everybody. Three years ago, we started our ballot transfer division. We got a report this week. We are cancer free. <laughs> Amen. I've had a couple people ask me how the Trump retreat went. I'll throw this. I know it's been two weeks ago now, but surprisingly, it was a rousing success. <laughs> Even though we had to move it inside, um, we had to make a second candy run. We cut back on our candy, thinking the weather was going to be nasty and wouldn't be a lot of people out. Forty-five minutes in, Richie came to me and said, "We got to have more candy. We're out." <laughs> so. Uh, Again, thank you for supporting that ministry, and I'll call it a ministry. I truly believe that's what it is. Um, for those of you who don't know what it is, come to me after the worship, and I'll explain it to you. <laughs> and uh, you know, Trisha, sorry. Children, if you brought your coin bags this morning for the shoe boxes. Bring those and place them here at the front during the children's sermon. If you didn't, you can bring them in later. Um, our, and our children will be pa packing those Operation Christmas Child shoe boxes this Wednesday night. Um, and then we will probably still need some more money for shipping. So if you want to help out too, if, if a child hasn't asked you for their coins, then um, you can make some donations to help with that. Thanks. Um, Wednesday night, Christmas. Six o'clock. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I've got a couple announcements this morning. Uh, first, deacon nominations are still open, and those are open until Monday, November 18th. There are sheets, should be some, uh, out there in the foyer. There's also some outside the church office on the table there. Um, as part of deacon nominations, you as church members, it's your responsibility to go to someone individually. Uh, there's two sheets. Uh, there's a list of the, those who uh, are available for nomination or eligible for nomination. So look over that sheet. And then if there's someone that you do want to nominate, uh, go to that person and take the, the information sheet that they will need to sign to agree that they would be willing to serve if they are elected. So we've had several of those nominations come in. We need more. Uh, so I encourage you to, to do that uh, within the next week so that we can get all those, those nominations in uh, by November 18th. Also, uh, a lot of different ministry activities going on this time of year. One of those is Operation Christmas Child. Uh, I think shoe boxes are, are in different parts of the facility here in the church building. So pick one of those up and uh, take it home and the instructions should, should be there. And then pack a shoe box and bring it back. Uh, next Sunday is when we will have uh, that dedication of those shoe boxes. We are also the central location, the drop-off site for our entire county for people that are packing shoe boxes. They bring them here and then we take them to uh, Boone, uh, to the station there where they will be uh, uh, sent elsewhere. So uh, November 18th, 20th, and 25th are days that we need volunteers to help do that intake. And so if you would like to help out with that, contact Laura McClure, her information's in the bulletin, and let her know that you'll be willing to volunteer on one of those days. Also, uh, it is Veterans Day weekend, and uh, today uh, we would like to recognize those that are veterans among us. So if you are a veteran, if you would please stand. We want to say that we recognize you, we honor you, and we thank you for your service. Are there any other announcements today? If not, let us prepare our hearts and our minds for worship as we encounter the risen Christ who promises to be in our midst and we are gathered in His name.
one who was and is and is to come welcomes us into this place. As one body with one voice, we honor and glorify the giver of wisdom, counsel, knowledge, joy, and peace. O root of Jesse, O peace, stir up your power within us, that in this time we may wait, await with abundant expectation, abundant expectations, the fulfillment of your external presence in creation. For you live and reign among us, maker, savior, and giver of life. Let us lay before God and one another the distances between us, the impatience, the idolatries, and lack of compassion that form our confessions this day. For in mercy, God will forgive and renew us. And in God, the light that shines in the darkness, we light the candle of peace. Amen. Please take your hymnals and stand as we sing our hymn of praise, number 80, Hope, Peace, Joy, and Love. And we will sing the verse that pertains today to peace, and we'll sing it through two times. <laughs> For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, so that by steadfastness and by the encouragement of scriptures we might have hope. May the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus so that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome one another, therefore, just as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the circumcised on behalf of the truth of God in order that he might confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, Therefore I will confess you among the Gentiles and sing praises to your name. And again he says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples praise him. And again, Isaiah says, The root of Jesse shall come to one who rises to rule the Gentiles. In him the Gentiles shall have hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
And our other reading comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. Hear these words. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then the people of Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to him, and all the region along the Jordan. And they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stories to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance. But one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Would you join me in prayer, please? God of hope, you raised up John the baptizer as a herald who calls us to conversion. As we joyfully await the glorious coming of Christ, we pray to you for the needs of the church and our world, especially for these. Madison Hudler, the family of Toby Gentry, Wayne Reynolds, Mike Mincy, Francis Jordan, Clifton Hardison, Emily Brown Theodore, John Brown, Pat McNeil, the family of Rebecca Krishan, Stan and Jennifer Tresky, Unspoken, Walt Peterson, Eric Simmons, Kathy Simmons, Tommy Simmons, Caitlin Dixon, Paulette Lawrence, and Danny Fox. Hear our humble prayer that we may serve you in holiness and faith and give voice to your presence among us until the day of the coming of your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns forever and ever and who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Children, please come to the front and join this channel. <coughs> So last week, we lit the candle of hope, and today, we lit the candle of peace. So I want you to look at what I have in my hands. Do you all know what these are? Does anybody know? What, what do you think? What? Well, 
they kind of look like dominoes, blocks. But let me see if this helps you. It's a magnet, isn't it? So what does a magnet do? It does stick together and it attracts to metal. And, and sometimes uh, magnets like this, they'll actually stick like this. But you know what? If a magnet is turned the wrong way, it will not, as hard as I push, and it will apart. yes, it will not connect at all. So if it's the right way, it sticks. it sticks. But if that magnet is turned the wrong way, it just won't connect. Well, in our scripture story today, um, it was about John the Baptist. Now I want to tell you about him. He was kind of a strange fellow. And he wore clothes that were made out of camel hair. And his favorite food was honey, which sounds pretty good. And into the honey he would dip locust, which are bugs. <laughs> kind of strange, isn't it? Yeah, it is kind of yucky. But you know, the best part about John the Baptist was this. His whole job, his whole purpose in life was to preach to people and tell them to get ready because the Messiah is coming. And you know how he told them to get ready? He used a word that we use in church all the time. He said, repent. Can you say that word? Repent. repent. Now that's a big word for church, but it has a real simple meaning. It means turn around. Because you see, like if you're going down the wrong road, you don't want to keep going down the wrong road because you'll never get where you're going. You need to make a U-turn and go back to the right road. Well, you see, John the Baptist knew that these people were not listening to God. They weren't obeying. They weren't following God. And they couldn't connect. They just couldn't connect with Jesus. And he really wanted the people to be able to connect with Jesus. But he knew there was only one way, and that was they needed to repent. And in other words, when they were doing wrong things, they needed to turn around and do right things. You see, John the Baptist knew that to connect to Jesus was important because that would give you the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, back in Bible days, for everybody in this sanctuary, including you and me, the Holy Spirit helps me share God's healing, God's blessings, God's love, God's kindness, God's patience, with everybody around me. But if I'm not connected to Jesus, I can't give that gift to someone else. So the good news today is that when we pay attention to God, we are connected to Jesus, and then we are filled with the Holy Spirit, who is our God and helps us make the right decisions. Would you pray with me, please? Dear God, help me to turn my attention to Jesus. My attention to Jesus. Jesus will fill me with the Holy Spirit. Amen. stand as we sing our offertory hymn number 85, Christians All, Your Lord is Coming.
God, we thank You so much for giving us another day. We thank You for the opportunity to come to, a, to Your house to worship You, to praise You. Father, we pray that in this moment You'll bless these offerings. That You'll bless the work that they can do. Lead God and direct us in how we can minister, how we can share our tithes and our offerings. Open our eyes to opportunities of how we can help, how we can minister, how we can share your love. These things we ask in thy name. Amen.
show some pictures, so if y'all want okay. to see it, you're behind you. You don't want to go Thank you, Cooper. Thank you to the trio. All the beautiful music, the children's sermon, everything this morning. What wonderful worship. Let us pray together. Gracious God, how amazing indeed is your grace. Grace that came down as the Word made flesh in Jesus. This Advent, we prepare for that coming. We remember the first coming of Christ. And we remember that your promise that you're always with us. Coming into our lives every day. Through the risen Christ and through your Spirit. Come to us once again. And fill us with your presence as we hear your word, as we seek to understand it, and as we seek to live as the one that we follow, that the word may be made flesh in us. In your name, amen. So we are in the season of Advent. Now again, we have decided to do this season of Advent early, the season that reflects on the coming of Christ in Christ Jesus and Christmas prepares for His coming again. And I recognize that it is a season that evokes strong emotions and feelings. Many of these feelings are sentimental, they're nostalgic. Sometimes they don't actually reflect the meaning of Advent and Christmas itself. Other feelings are authentic and genuinely represent the true meaning of Christ's coming. The latter, those, those genuine, authentic feelings, point to the true meaning of Advent and Christmas, which is less of a feeling and more of a feeling. Now, every Advent includes the preacher John the Baptist, John the Baptizer, and his message of repentance. If you went to John's church on the Sunday morning that he was preaching, to get a warm, fuzzy, nostalgic, sentimental feeling, you would soon realize that you had come to the wrong place. John's message had an edge to it. And it began with a location. Okay, John, was, John was in this wilderness. When we talk about the Judean wilderness, I don't know what you have imagined, but just southeast of Jerusalem, there is a wilderness, and it is a desert wilderness. It is rocky, it is rugged. It looks as if it is devoid of any life, human life, or any life, that is. This is the wilderness to which John went, to where he started the church, to where he began to preach a message of repentance. It was hot. It was dry. The suburban sprawl had not made it to this wilderness yet. It was not heavily populated. But because it was an important place for Jewish pilgrims, there were a lot of people who joined John there. You see, this, this wilderness was the actual wilderness or the very wilderness through which the, the Jewish people, the people of Israel in the book of Exodus, crossed over the Jordan River into the land of promise, the land of Canaan. And so they were in this wilderness for a while before they crossed over the Jordan River. And it was at that river that John was baptized. John's message about repentance, so literally turning one's life around, which Janie talked about in her children's sermon this morning, following the ways of God, it was connecting with people from all over the region. John wasn't your traditional person or preacher. He wore the same outfit every Sunday, ate truly organic diet, desert bugs and wild honey, and his message was just as down to earth and straightforward as his person. 
close to the same place where the people of Israel crossed over into that promised land. Again, John was telling people to turn to God. And he baptized those who confessed their sins and desired to walk in the ways of the Lord. we got some more of those pictures, Jim. Just kind of flip through those. So this is that wilderness where John did this. The Jordan River is located somewhere in this wilderness. Actually, the, what, the water that you see in the distance there is actually the Dead Sea. Who knows how many people made up John's church. Matthew tells us that the people from the city of Jerusalem and all Judea were attending his services. The Gospels doesn't, don't give us an exact amount, but, but what they indicate to us is that a lot of people were going. You know when someone says to you, you know, that they were somewhere and everybody was there. Right? Everybody was there. That's what the Gospel writers are saying. John was preaching. John started the church in this desert wilderness and everybody was there. Everybody from all over the region was going down to hear John preach. It's interesting. Matthew tells us there were some other folks who showed up. Some of the religious leaders from Jerusalem and from the surrounding region. They had come to, to, to hear John's message. Well, we know that they really had not come for all the right reasons. And John sniffs this out as, as they get near. And he knows these whom Jesus frequently called hypocrites or two-faced. John had a special message for them titled Snakes in the Grass. Right? He calls them serpents, you brood of vipers. This is, this is not a complimentary phrase. He told them that their historical ties to their ancestors wouldn't save them. And he told them that if they wanted to show true repentance, that they would have to show this by the fruit of their lives. John told the crowds he had not come to preach to them about a feeling, but a feeling of the Holy Spirit of God. He was there to point them to the very one who was coming to give them that Spirit, Jesus of Nazareth, God in the flesh. And he wanted to prepare them for Jesus, to call them repentance and baptize them as a representation of that. Then we, we flip over to Romans today in the other lectionary text. And, and in this epistle, the Apostle Paul reflects on a similar feeling of the Holy Spirit. Now Paul was writing to a predominantly Gentile audience, a non-Jewish audience. And Paul reminds them that Christ had come for all. Now why was this important? Because many of the Gentiles were being told by their, their Jewish colleagues the followers of Jesus that were Jewish, that, that they were not fully Christian, really. That they were not fully followers of Christ. That they really didn't cut it because they did not fully follow the Jewish law. They had to fully be Jewish converts. And this was an argument within the earliest church. And we see it reflected in many of Paul's letters. So Paul is encouraging them. Saying, you know, Christ died for you too. Christ came for you as well. Don't listen to what you're hearing from those who tell you that you're not good enough. Paul reminds them, just as John had preached, that a person didn't have to have a certain heritage to be welcomed into the family of God. That through Jesus, there's hope for all who believe and repent or turn to follow Jesus. And consistent with John's message, Paul communicated that Jesus has filled all who believe with the Holy Spirit and that the fruits of those Spirit are manifest in us. He gives some examples, the demonstration of love and hospitality or welcome, the hope of the resurrection and the joy and the peace of Christ. Both John and Paul were calling their audiences to repentance. This means that there was something from which they needed to turn. John's audience, John's audience, for them it was this, this personal claim to a heritage and a tradition without an evaluation of our relationship to that heritage and tradition based on the current movements of God. John was saying in another way, maybe this is a way we can hear it, because your grandfather built this church doesn't mean you're a follower of the one whose name you claim, right? Right? John went from preaching to meddling, <laughs> as we say. On the flip side, he was saying just because you or your family have never had any relationship to God and the church doesn't mean you can't now. 
This message is for you. This message is for all. Repent, turn, make a change, be baptized with water, and follow the One who can baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul, he was preaching a similar message but to his Gentile friends in Rome. But they were discouraged. Maybe they had, again, some Jewish Christians who told them they, just, they weren't good enough for Jesus because of their history. There were several types of discrimination that they were facing. Racial, religious, social, economic. Paul was encouraging them to turn from such division, to turn from such prejudice, to live confidently in the faith that they claim through Jesus who had filled them with the Spirit of God. Paul said, show the fruit of the Spirit. Show love. Show joy. Show the hope of the resurrection that you have in Christ. Show the peace of Christ that is in you that surpasses all understanding. Praise God. Live in harmony, he said. Welcome each other with a radical love and hospitality. So both John and Paul had a, a, a message about an Advent filling. God's coming to us in Jesus who, who fills us with the very Spirit of God. You know, one Advent, in every Advent, you can't avoid John the Baptist unless you just intentionally do so. John the Baptist and his messages is essentially there every Advent season for us to encounter and preach and, and it's, it's funny, I, I've said this before, but, but you don't see many uh, John the Baptist ornaments on people's trees. And then I had someone in the church. You know, oh, there's the guy with locusts and wild honey uh, and camel's hair. And then I had someone in the church who actually uh, found a John the Baptist ornament and, and put them on their tree. So anyway, I, I preached about John the Baptist as I do every Advent. And I had a church member come to me and tell me that they were offended because that particular sermon didn't put them in the mood for Christmas. We talked. I'm open to your feedback. Um, I wasn't offended. I got the sense that the kind of mood for Christmas to which this person was referring was primarily our, our American cultural Christmas. You know, the one about snow and sleigh bells and, and, and happy families singing deck the halls around a warm fireplace while they decorate their Christmas tree with ornaments that are not John the Baptist. I was in tune. I was aware of the reality this season and holiday brings many attachments and, and memories and feelings, not all of which reflect the true meaning of Advent and Christmas. And I said to this person, well, you know, John doesn't put me in the mood either for the kind of Christmas that, that I think that you're talking about. I said, but, but John does challenge us to prepare our hearts for Christ and for His coming into our world the first time and into our hearts now and into our lives each and every day and into the promised second coming that he has said will happen. So we were able to talk about that meaning, that, that God has come to show us the love and way of God in Jesus, to, to fill us with the Holy Spirit and lead us into a life that is filled with the presence of Christ and the fruit of that Spirit. You know, any time we come to this place as a gathered community to read the Scriptures together to seek to understand its meaning. We take the risk of God challenging our lives. It's the risk we take every time we open the Scriptures, every time we read this story, every time we gather together and, and do this together, we take that risk. We can expect God will give us a word through John or Paul or Isaiah or Mary or Tabitha or Peter or Zechariah or Elizabeth and especially Jesus. We can anticipate that message will proclaim God's love for us and give us the good news, but it will also call us to repent from some way, some sin that we are literally missing the mark of God's love. Another Sunday, a member got into a conversation with me after the sermon, and, and they, they just let me know that they did, they did not like what Jesus was saying that Sunday. 
And they said, I'm going to have to take this up with you later. I said, well, you can, but you really need to take it up with Jesus. <laughs> I said, it, Jesus offends me too. <laughs> Jesus challenges me as well. That's the risk we take every week when we come here to encounter Him and to encounter His Word and His life. We can anticipate. And sometimes this message hits us like it did John's audience with a disruptive conviction of our complacency and our complicit acceptance of the culturally conventional acceptance of things as they are. Well, that's just the way it is. Things will never change. They've always done it that way. God challenges this every week. Every day. Other times we need Paul's message. One of encouragement. That hey, we are beloved children of God. For whom Jesus has come and, and through whom the Holy Spirit moves and works. And all of us all of us are enough. God loves us as we are. And we should keep on living in the way of Jesus. A way of loving and welcoming others as Christ. A way of glorifying and praising God with our worship. So that our lives may, may be filled genuinely with love and hope and joy and peace. That these are not just words that we say or catchphrases. That these are real things that can take place in our lives. Always, during the season, we can anticipate the gospel message, the, the good news of God's love revealed in Jesus Christ. And you know, really today, the sermon, the message is really about the message. And this message is one which will not always give us what we want. It won't necessarily put us in the kind of mood that, that maybe we had hoped for. But it will give us what we need. A good old fashioned Advent feeling. Let us pray. O oh God who comes to us and seeks to fill us with your very presence in the birth and the life and the ministry of Jesus who came and the way that He came surprised made people scratch their heads offended we dare to welcome you and to encounter you as we come each week for worship and as we wake up each day and invite you into our lives to lead us, to give us a word, to give us faith and courage to follow you in your way. Give us each week this Advent season a filling of your Holy Spirit and of the very presence of Christ who promises to be with us and in our midst always. I pray all this in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. We find our hymn of commitment today. Number 231. Breathe on me. Jesus, when He appeared to His disciples after His resurrection. He says He breathed on them. He gave them the Holy Spirit, filled them with His Spirit, and spoke words of peace, giving them joy and hope. And so today as we gather in anticipation of His coming to us, let us stand and let us sing. And let it be our prayer that He would breathe on us this day.
forth prayers and blessings that the Holy Spirit would fill each of us. That we would receive an Advent filling. And as we do, may the love of God the Father, the grace of Christ our Savior, and the fellowship and communion be with us all, now and forever. And let all God's people say, Amen. Amen.